all of you for being here and being a part of our service here at Old Fort Baptist Church. Come on up. I want, no, no, I want you up here. Up here by me. Come on. Come on. You can do it. This way. Come on up. You were the first one? All right, y'all, come on. Look at him coming down through here. Come on, we're going to wait on you. Isn't this beautiful? Come on. There you go. Come on over, gang. That's right. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Come on, we got some more. Come on, we'll wait. Look, he's bringing his box. All right, so when we get up here, we're going to look and look at all of these boxes, shoe boxes. Somebody raise your hand really high if you know what these shoe boxes are for. Do you know what they're for? What are they for? Holding Bibles. Where are they going? What do you know? Okay, hold on, hold on. Say that. They're going to different countries all around the world. Yes, amen. That's right. And what, did, what, what, why are we sending boxes to different countries? Do you know? You want to say? To give, to give kids toys. Okay. And also to spread the light and the gospel as well. Bring them joy. Gospel. Isn't that beautiful? You see, they get it. I hope you do as well. We are here to participate in the Operation Christmas Child and these shoe boxes are so much more than shoe boxes, so much more than just the contents of toys and games and some clothing and, and some literature. This is a way, a way of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world, starting with our children. You know, if you read your Bible, uh, you're going to notice that, particularly in the New Testament, Jesus had lots of time and support for the little ones, didn't he? He said, let the little children come to me. He knew that not only would that make a difference in this generation, but it'll make a difference in the next generation as well. Because these children are going to grow up and be great men and women for the glory of God. So here's what we're going to do now. I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. I want you to help me to pray. And we're going to pray for every box and every child that's going to receive one of our boxes as they'll be sent out this week. Join me in prayer. Everybody close your eyes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to share the gospel of Jesus in this very simple way through Operation Christmas Child. We thank you for our own children and our own grandchildren and, and the fact that they get to participate in sending this over and being missionaries this morning. But I also thank you that, that there will be many kids just like these from around the world who will receive these boxes and for the very first time many of them will hear the story of Jesus. Father, we pray for those children for their parents, for their leaders. And we ask that your message would be made so clear to them. And we'll thank you for it as we send this off in your name and for your glory. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. This month, you know, probably better than I do, that we talk about missions in November. And everything I know about this church so far is that we focus on missions. That is just part of the DNA of who we are. Maybe you're new here, uh, newer than me. You should know that though. It's not just empty words. Uh, sometimes we can say things and tend things, but in, in just the few months that I've been here, I, I can't say that much longer. I've been here for about five months. Um, there's been two major mission trips to Tanzania and Baltimore, and there are more just around the corner. Um, many, many conversations throughout the weeks that I've been here have been about mission opportunities, and um, that's, that's important to us. But why is it important to us? Why? Well, the short answer is because it's important to Jesus. But uh, the long answer is why I'm up here. <laughs> um, and today we're going to be in 2 Corinthians. If you would turn there with me to 2 Corinthians, uh, we're going to talk about the heart of missions because Jesus left us with really clear instructions for his disciples that we would go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I had commanded you. And uh, today in 2 Corinthians, we are learning from Paul, 
the Apostle Paul. We're in chapter 5. And um, Paul, maybe you know his story. Maybe you don't. Paul was a Jew. And he was a very, very religious Jew. He was a Jew of Jews. He was just exceptional in what he did. He was so zealous and passionate about his Jewishness that he would kill Christians, that he would hunt them down. It was open season for Christians for Paul. Um, And Jesus appeared to him on the way for him to take out some Christians. And he said, Paul, why are you persecuting my church? And uh, the short version is, uh, he came away from that experience a Christian. And an apostle, appointed as an apostle, someone specially equipped and appointed by God to reveal his word in the early church and to um, be a missionary. Um, and he went all over the Mediterranean, willingly and unwillingly, sometimes freely, sometimes in chains. And one of those stops was in Corinth. And Corinth was sort of like the Vegas of cities. And there was some problems in Corinth because Corinth was getting into the church rather than the church spreading and infecting the culture. The culture was spreading and infecting them. And uh, they, Corinth was the kind of place that prized themselves in their deviant behavior. This wasn't something that they were ashamed of at all. And it was getting into the church some. And so we have two letters from Paul. Um, there's probably three, but we only have two. And we're in the second letter in chapter 5. And in this second letter, Paul's defending himself because in the first letter, he said some really hard things, some very firm things because they were asking for it and needed to hear it. And the second letter, he's sort of recovering this relationship. He's, he's sort of trying to mend some wounds. He knows that he's spoken very, uh, harsh isn't the right word, but um, he's spoken in such a way that really put his finger on some uh, troublesome things in their lives. And the Corinthians naturally are like, who does this guy think he is? And why should we listen to him? And Paul's answer in short is, well, I'm, I'm an apostle. I'm appointed by God and I'm called to be your apostle, to care for you. He's sort of, it reminds me of when Gandalf was confronting Bilbo. Uh, He says, I am not trying to rob you. I'm trying to help you. And so it's great for us to hear from Paul today because he shows us the right heart and motivation for missions. He, because he shows that, because we all have this experience where there are good things in this life that we can turn into selfish things. The other day, I was being an exceptional husband. (laughs) I really, I I offered to go to the store to get my wife some ice cream. Um, That's pretty, you know, that's that's pretty nice, right? Um, And maybe, you know, maybe I should write this down in my journal as something I should specifically request a jewel in my crown for when I get to heaven. You know, I'm just really a great husband. But what if I told you that that thought originated about a couple hours earlier when I looked in the fridge and thought, man, I'd really like some ice cream. (laughs) Sometimes we can really make our good deeds look so generous, um, but they're not always as sacrificial as we'd like them to be. Um, I even think about an experience that I'm, I'm positive that you've had in some, at some level is you want to do a good thing. You want to get your family to church. And somehow or another, from the front door to the pew, everyone starts hating each other. Everyone just is bickering in the car or just frustrated with each other. You can't get everyone there on time and people have attitudes and that attitude spreads and there's this good thing that you want to do, but man, sometimes your heart and your motivation can get tripped up along the way. And well, that's just sort of who we are as people. Sometimes we can want to do the right thing and we get lost along the way. Um, I'm reminded of a mission trip that I took to Europe. 
this was my first adult mission trip. And this was really my first mission trip as a Christian. And I went and I was just there sort of to learn. I went with some peers of mine and some friends of mine that I knew to be good friends and Christians were complaining a lot along the way. And I mean, it was rough. Don't get me wrong. There was really long plane rides. There was delays, but they were complaining a lot. And then sort of midway through the trip, all they started talking about was this free day at the end they were really excited about. They were going to get to uh, walk around the town and be a tourist for a day. And I realized, maybe in retrospect, that they, what they had in mind, what they wanted to do was more like a vacation than a mission trip. And um, we all have similar temptations where we want to make it about us, where we, we really want to put the I in Christ, <laughs> in Christian. Like, we, we want to do good things, but we want to make it about ourselves. Um, and so we're going to hear Paul talk about his why today, his motivations for missions. So why do we go to Tanzania, Baltimore, Southeast Asia? And I, I trust this will challenge you like it challenges me because um, that's where it starts for me. Uh, when I read this passage, I find myself challenged and falling short. <laughs> um, so let's read uh, just the first couple verses, verses 11 through 13 in chapter 5 together. Um, I'm going to break it up in a few different pieces. Again, he's defending his ministry here. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God. And I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. In this passage, the whole of the passage that we'll read, I see three motivations and two strategies for us as Christians, for everyone who follows Christ. And the first, the first motivation is the fear of the Lord. And I just want to ask you today, who do you fear? Who or what do you fear? And I, I don't ask if you fear someone or something. What do you fear? Because we are built for awe and reverence and worship. And it is just part of who we are that we take cues from other people. We take warnings and cautions and that directs and guides us. And Paul says that his fear of the Lord directs how he speaks to people about Jesus. That, and, and really, in this point, Paul is defending that he's not just pandering to people. He's just not um, telling them what they want to hear. But this is the same fear that the Proverbs talks about. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not this trembling or dread. It's an awe. It's where it's an awe that directs how you live because of a great respect. And, and Paul knows he is forgiven, but that doesn't cancel out his concern for trying to live his life to the glory of God, and not living in vain. And uh, we see actually in 1 Corinthians 5, I believe it's 5, uh, Paul talks about how all our works will be tested. Even Christians, our works will be tested so that, you know, that, that ice cream run is not going on my ledger of, you know, selfless <laughs> acts of worship. Uh, the Lord sees through those things. And it's a silly example, but nonetheless. Um, and so I think what for Paul, this means he rehearses the thought to himself, does this please God? And for, it also means for him, an apostle, he's not going to change what God has said to pander to people, to make people feel uh, good about bad decisions or a lack of uh, trusting the Lord. Um, because there are sharp edges to the Christian faith, are there not? 
There are some sharp edges. The, the things we believe are not always pleasant or palatable to someone who is not a Christian. There's sexual ethics that are very out of vogue, that are just not, not what people want to hear today. Um, even the fact that we believe in evangelism, some people think that's just ridiculous. Um, maybe our, our ethic of self, self-denial, uh, that teaching of Jesus to deny yourself, that I love, Eric, Eric has you guys on that verse like every other week. I love it. Um, has us on that week. It, maybe or maybe the, the rough edges of the faith like final judgment in hell. These are not things that the world finds palatable. But Paul's not going to change that. Maybe, maybe you remember Jesus' words in Matthew 10. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but can, cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So, who do you fear? And how does that impact how you speak to God, speak God's word to people? The second motivation is sort of the, the other side of the coin of the fear of God. And it's the love of God. And, and we should never separate these. The fear of God and the love of God, they should, they should go hand in hand. We should never separate them because there are religions that are just based on awe and reverence and fear, but there is not a love. There is not a love component. Um, and, and this is what he says in verse 14. Um, I'm just going to read like half of 14 because motivation three is in the other half. Uh, but the, for the love of Christ controls us, dot, dot, dot. The love of Christ controls Paul and his, his group. It, so what, what do you love the most? What thing or person is that thing or person that you are ultimately devoted to, that everything else comes second to. Love is this expression of highest devotion with our mind, body, and soul. And everyone loves. None of us do not love. Many of you have children you love, and you give sacrificially for them. Many of you have spouses and you serve them generously. Um, and in this world, people, people love money, and so they will do anything to get it. People love power, so they'll put others down, lift themselves up. They love possessions, so they will be consumed with the game of cons- just accumulation. People love their dreams of athletic fame, so they are obsessed with practice and games and reviewing and training on the off season and people are uh, obsessed with or uh, love their uh, academic dreams so they uh, put off every other part of their life just to to get that degree the christian has a different word different word of instruction he says love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength Love your neighbor as yourself. And a primary way we show that love is to be on mission for Jesus. And you know what? That's really weird. <laughs> it's weird, and Paul knows it. He says, if, if I'm in my right mind, it is for you. But if I'm beside myself, it is for God. Paul is willing to be known as a weirdo. This, this fear and this love is alien. It's otherworldly. And b- because the world doesn't know it, they look at it and think, y'all are a little weird. They, their calculator doesn't have a button to make the equation work. Because God is not the main, sto- main character in their story. So, He's willing to be known as a little cuckoo. And, and the reason that he 
is fine with this. I'm not, I'm sure Paul struggled with this because there's, there's no person who doesn't struggle with this, honestly. But he understood that everyone is passing out judgment. Everyone. Everyone in the world has values and judgments they're making about the people around them. But God is also passing out judgments. He's actually made them very clear, praise the Lord. Um, but Paul has resolved, you know what? I'm just going to let God's judgments, his, his directions, what God cares about is just going to be first on my list. And there may be sometimes, sometimes there's an overlap. Sometimes the world says, looks at what Christians do and says, hey, that, that makes sense. But sometimes they don't. And that's the hard part. Those are the choices we have. There, there isn't really a third way where we get love and acceptance from the world and God. It's, we have to be li- willing to be called things like dumb or, you know, people think we're idiots, to use a little stronger language. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so this is a hard place to live because you and me, all of us, we love to be loved. We want attaboys. We want pats on the back. That's just who we are for better or worse. We want the prizes the world has to offer of money, power, popularity. Our heart longs for those things. And if we pretend we don't, we're just fooling ourselves, really. Um, But the problem with those, getting those prizes is that you have to play their game by their rules. And their rules say, oh, you have to, you have to set aside the Lord's instructions. You, You can't be that weirdo around here. And so fear and love of God are the first two motivations. And maybe the most, uh, not maybe, the most important motivation is the third one. Maybe the first one and the second one, you're like, fear and love of God, all right, got it. When I read that, when I think about that, honestly, I feel like I've come up short. I see in my own heart the pull to crave the attention or acceptance of people who, you know, don't always mirror God's judgments. Um, And so this third motivation is the most important one. And this is, this is the foundation of the fear and love of God. It gives coherence to it. And I'm not just inferring it. Paul says it in verse 14. He says, for the love of God, the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So this tells us that the death and resurrection of Christ is Paul's big why. Because Christ died for all so that all who live in him would no longer live for themselves, but for him. This is, we see clearly here, a substitution. Christ standing in our place. The the cross is not just an example, although it is an example. Christ stood in our place. God's punishment of sin for sinners like you and me was, was dealt with on that cross. The horror that Jesus endured on the cross was in my place. And Paul finds the foundation, this, this, this love and fear of God arises out of this, knowing that this is not just a story about a man who died and rose again. It is a man who died and rose again for me. His story has become my story. That's where Paul gets his, his oomph, his zeal. This is, this is why the gospel is for Christians. Why it's not just in this 
entrance into the faith. It's something that sustains our faith. The cross is the, the central thing of our faith that gives coherence to all other parts of our life. God made Jesus to become sin, though he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, and in Christ we are new creations. This is the, the new birth where our obligation to sin is broken. Our minds are enlightened. Our hearts are filled with the joy, joy in the Holy Spirit. And our life takes a turn. Not to perfection, but to following after Jesus. And this is what we talk about in baptism. Dying with Christ, being raised with him to new life. Christ's story becomes, becomes our story. I'm reminded of John the Baptist who was having this church service uh, in a river, a baptism service, and he was in the middle of his thing, and he looked up, and he thought, wait a second, everyone pause. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God, the sins of God's people were laid on animals in the Old Testament, but they are laid on Christ in the New Testament for the end of sacrifice and the end of our sin. The, they are laid on the perfect lamb who is qualified, the only one qualified, so that he can save us to the other, uttermost, as Hebrews says. So for Paul, this meant two things. For Paul, two things changed in his life, and these are mature reflections of Paul. I'm not saying like you become a Christian today, you're going to be Paul tomorrow. These are mature reflections nonetheless. Uh, but two things the cross and resurrection mean for Paul. That God is the central person that defines every part of his reality. And two that the cross and the resurrection are the events that define his reality. See, each, you and me, we all have these people and events in our lives that define us. You know, uh, my parents define me growing up, my siblings, my friends, um, my, my peers at school, my wife, my daughters, they define me more than anything else today um, in terms of the people in my immediate community. Uh, and then there's events in our life that define our life. There's marriages. There's graduations. There's births. There's deaths. There's tragedies. There's broken relationships. There's uh, all of these, these things mold us and shape us and define us. And for Paul, the person and events molded him more than anything else are the person of Christ and his, his death and resurrection. It is the sun in his universe. It was the rudder on his ship. It was the GPS that just gave meaning to every decision in his life. And this is the mature way to, that a Christian orders his life or her life because this is reality. It's not just a subjective experience that Paul had. That is the fabric of our reality. Jesus created all things to display his glory, his perfection, his love. And the cross is the greatest display of that. And so to go, to go, to be on mission for Jesus is something that everyone who professes Christ should take part of. Christ gave himself in full, the, the God of the universe. <laughs> he gave himself in full by, because he gave himself on the cross, dying for sinners like you and me in our place so that we would know him, love him, rejoice in him, and go in his name. And so this is our, really our greatest privilege. So let's look at, those are the three motivations. Let's look at the two strategies that Paul has. Um, 
in verses 16 through 21. Let's read that together. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. There, if any, if anyone, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so we see here that Paul he saw, the, he saw Christ before he became a Christian in a certain way. He saw him as a Jewish troublemaker who was starting a sect of people that were also troublemakers. And that the best option is to just get rid of them. But his, his eyes were enlightened. His heart, the, the eye, literally the scales fell off his eyes, but also metaphorically <laughs> for Paul. Uh, and he saw Jesus for who he was, the Savior, the Lord of heaven and earth, divine Son of God. But in addition to that, he also learned to look at other people differently. He didn't just look at people around him according to the flesh. He learned to see people through God's lens. And we all have that temptation to Look at people in distorted ways. The people that we see in our homes, in our, at work. We, we all struggle with treating people and seeing people the way God sees people. Um, but that's what happens when Jesus becomes the center of your universe. Just like when they actually learned that the sun was the center of our galaxy, that um, or I'm not sure galaxy is right, our little solar system, uh, the, other, the other planets finally made sense. They were like, oh, this makes sense. It's, okay, we understand now how the other planets are operating. Well, that's how, that's how our world is. When, when Christ is the center of our life, other people, we see them differently. He sees them as image bearers precious to God, deceived by sin, desperately needing the gospel. But here's the thing. Paul just doesn't see other people differently. He sees himself differently. He sees himself as an ambassador. An ambassador is one trusted to represent a foreign king with a message. He is a rep for the kingdom of God. And so for you and me, if we are Christians... If we bear the name of Christ, we are different from this world. We are ambassadors. Our first identity is not just employee number 4682. We are ambassadors. More than just an um, employee or community member in an HOA, more than just a neighbor, more than just... Uh, an, an entrepreneur, a, a low country resident, you are an ambassador. And if people will not hear the gospel from our mouth, those who are commissioned by God to share his message, then who will they hear it from? Are we waiting for Balaam's donkey to speak up? It's us or no one. Remember what Paul said, he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him for who for, who for their sake died and was raised. And so mature, for mature Christians, mission is not just an add-on. It's not just an extra hobby like woodworking or exercising at the gym. Mission is part of the fabric of our faith. 
And I struggle with that. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't mean we all have to do the same thing at the same time. Uh, we all, it doesn't mean everyone in here has to go to Tanzania in January. I'm not sure Patty would want that. That would be a logistical uh, something else. Um, but we are all called to be light in the darkness, speaking God's truth and his message to a broken world. So this message is one that creates reconciliation, he talks about here. He talks about how there is this divide between God and man, and this mends that divide. This heals that divide between God and men. Paul writes in uh, Romans about how, this, how uh, faith in Christ cre- uh, it gives us peace with God. We become enemies, we go from enemies to friends, foe to family. But think about this letter we're reading. This letter is Paul's way of saying, guys, let's be united in the gospel. But this reconciliation is not just an abstract idea in Paul's head. This is something that he is practicing through this letter. He is trying to mend this relationship with this church, with these people that some are upset with him. In the early church, it was, the question was Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentiles were united. And uh, even some of the apostles, especially Peter, struggled with this. Uh, sometimes they had to put their heads together and try and figure out what the next move was because it was not what they were coming from. They, they came from a strict divide. But Paul is trying to iron out these issues and he is trying to be a peacemaker like Christ taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers. So this world stokes division with fear and anger. Paul is seeking to be one who makes peace. And this is Jesus' example, is it not? He came from heaven. He could have just sat back on his heavenly throne and said, you know what? Let's do that Noah's Ark thing again. Hold the ark. We were, we were, not, he, we were not obligated to his mercy and love, but he came. His example was he inserted himself into our muck and brokenness and sin, and he came for us. He could have, and this is what Jesus tells his disciple, the disciples in John 20. Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. So the fear and love of God motivate Paul. But in this grows out of the cross of Christ. This is where this love and fear of God grow into mature action for Paul. And this leads him to be a bold ambassador, a bold messenger for God's people, to God's people, and to those who are lost. And he is a peacemaker as much as it depends on him. So I'll just, I'll just close by asking a few of the same questions that I asked that are reflective questions. These are questions that we have to go to the Lord with, I think, and just ask him to show us these realities in our life. Who do you fear? Do you speak God's truth to people? How does that affect the way you engage with folks? Who do you love? And how does that control you? What is the cross to you? Is it the ground, it is, is it your motivation? Are the, is the, the death and resurrection of Jesus the event that is the center of your reality? Is Jesus the person who is the center of your reality? This alien message makes us aliens in this world to where we, we're not quite at home here anymore when we become new. Maybe there's someone you need to make peace with be a peacemaker like Paul. Stick your neck out to bring unity like Paul was. As the Father sends the Son, so he sends us. What is the Lord calling you today? I'm going to pray, 
And I'd love for us to just, I'd love to respond with you in praise to God. Uh, but also prayer and confession, if that's what the Lord is calling us to. I just think, as, as we wrap up, there's these moments, there's these times of response where we have, there's an open altar, there's music. I, I'm concerned sometimes that we miss out on a blessing from the Lord because we're not willing to be transparent about what's going on in our life. We don't maybe want to look weird or we don't want to... Um, we're, just, we're just a little bit too concerned about what other people think. Do business with the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for today. I thank you for your love for us in Jesus. We thank you that Jesus became sin on our behalf so that we would become the righteousness of God. I just ask that you would move in here, that people would be called out of complacency, that we would move and that we would go that we would have a heart of missions that is just full of your love because you loved us first.